Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to respond to a video that was done by Big Daddy Linux, and that was done on November the 9th. And it was a request from Alan Pope was, how do you use ARM? It was right at the tail end of it. And so I thought I would do that. So stay tuned right after this. So at the, uh, yeah, at the tail end of the uh, broadcast, there was a, a, a short discussion uh, about ARM and the ability to find packages and some of the limitations of the architecture and so forth. So at the end, Alan said, you know, how do you guys or how are you guys using ARM? And it really had reference more to the Pinebook Pro uh, laptop. And, uh, but, you know, I, I thought, well, I, I, I use ARM, I use ARM a lot. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do one. And so let's jump in and see how, <laughs> how I use ARM. So my system architecture is server-based. I have one machine that has a desktop environment on it that is ARM-based. And, uh, but, you know, from a, from a general standpoint, I use a mix of x86 and I use a mix of ARM. Uh, in order to uh, to uh, do my networks, I have uh, actually three networks uh, in my uh, architecture. I have a storage net which I isolate the cluster traffic so that uh, any of the it is pretty chatty between servers because it is doing replication between the uh, different storage boxes. So I really don't want that traffic on my main network. And then then I have my uh, home network or or my you know the dirty network which is at the bottom which has the wireless router on it, some IoT devices, and some media servers, and a, and a <laughs> internet-connected TV. So I sequester all those. I don't allow those to touch my network, uh, except through a VPN. And so <laughs> it isolates all the other junk off. Um, as far as the internal side, uh, and just to kind of step through it, I use a PFSense firewall. I use a guard, and a guard normally is used to transfer files from uh, a more secure environment to a less secure environment, but in my case, I have it reversed. I use it to transfer uh, in, uh, files from the open internet to my network. And so what a guard basically does is it looks for malware. It, it, uh, uh, it allows you to sequester uh, files to be checked manually. If, uh, if there's some doubt about it, it also will look at email. I have an AI server tied into it so that it doesn't allow malicious emails into my network. Uh, and basically, that is a kind of a throwaway environment. So if there's something that happens, you can obliterate the, uh, uh, the dirty side of the guard. But anyway, uh, that's a topic probably for another day. Uh, audit server just audits the logs. Uh, the AI server, as I mentioned, does a number of processes, and one of them is to monitor e inbound emails. Uh, I have an Ansible server. When you have this many boxes, it's really a pain in the butt to go out and update them all. So <laughs> I have an Ansible server that not only does the updates, it does the initial installs, it does the security configuration initially on new machines, it also does backups. So uh, that's what I use Ansible for. I, I also run some ad hoc utilities if I need them from time to time. Uh, and, uh, and so I'll do that if I need to install packages on certain boxes and not others. And Ansible allows you to do that. There's, um, there's some really good videos on Ansible by uh, the uh, Urban Penguin, if you're interested in that. Um, he did a really good job of uh, of, uh, of putting those together. And so rather than me repeat all the goodness that he has done, go check him out. Uh, I have a radius server, which does the, uh, I have web enterprise. And so that does the uh, enterprise check for, uh, for the wireless. And it's kind of a weird way that it works, but it, the wireless machine router does not actually have access to the radius server, but uh, that's a topic for another time. Also have DNS servers and LDAP servers involved, and then there is a NAS and a, a, a VM server using XCPNG, and those are on all in the x86 network. So that's how basically my my uh, system is put together. So uh, I'm not taking a contrary position to what Alan said. I don't disagree with anything really that he said during the broadcast. I'm just trying to explain what I did 
uh, with, uh, with, with my ARM uh, installation here. So ARM is slow. Yeah, it's slow. It's slower than an x86, but you know, that's changing. As you, if you go back to my video on ARM, you'll notice that the newest Qualcomm chip is on par with the uh, Intel 8700K. So uh, I, I don't think that'll be very much longer. Now, in the SBC world, none of those advanced chips have appeared yet. So we're waiting on those. Cost, however, is much lower than x86, and everybody forgets that. Uh, yeah, it's slow, but, you know, uh, do you want to pay $20,000 for an x86 server, or do you want to pay a few a thousand? Now, <clears throat> you can buy caviums that are up in the $20,000 range, don't get me wrong, but for home use, do you really need that kind of server? Uh, I find the, uh, you know, the $50 board, $75 board is just fine for doing servers. Uh, ARM doesn't have a lot of RAM. That is very true. Uh, and, but that really isn't the fault of the ARM chip. That's the SBCs, and they're trying to hold the cost down. Uh, <clears throat> most of them come with one gig. You can buy two gig or four gig. I haven't seen too many that do eight. There are a few, but they're, uh, but they're few and far between. So, yeah, you have to be careful with the RAM. Uh, for desktops, that's going to be an issue because <clears throat> uh, you're going to run out of memory a lot sooner there than you are in a server environment just because the apps are a little bit more heavyweight. For servers, this is certainly not an issue. Uh, and the mantra that I follow is the one I learned. Uh, the AT&T Bell Labs mantra, and this was back in the days when we had machines even less than a gig, was one application, one server. And that works well with ARM. Uh, that methodology works just fine. And remember, uh, you're, you're not, we're not dealing with $20,000 here. We're dealing with costs of $55 up to $75 per server. So not a big concern. So uh, I did a little bit of an explanation on this. Uh, so uh, the server types that I actually use is the PFSense firewall is x86. There are ARM versions of PFSense. However, uh, I need more network connections than those boxes provide, and I don't like, yes, you can have multiple uh, network connections on a single network using VLAN, but I don't really like that solution. The VLANs are fine, but they do not, uh, they are not good isolators of network traffic. There is ways that you can break them and get access to a network uh, through a VLAN, so I prefer not to do that. Uh, <clears throat> Guard is an Odroid N2. I talked a little bit about what that does. Uh, the audit server is also an Odroid N2. Uh, the AI machine is an NVIDIA Jetson Nano, and that is the one I do run a, uh, a full desktop on. Currently, I'm running uh, uh, currently I'm running PDE Plasma, but I don't remember exactly which version it is. It is based on Ubuntu 18.04 LTS. I think it's 04.3 LTS. And then the uh, Ansible servers are Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, I have a Radius server that's running on a Tinkerboard S. I have a kind of a mismatch. I like to test things, and so I'll, I'll swap servers around just to kind of see which one performs in the, in it, in, under the best application. So I'll, I have played around with you know, using Raspberry Pis as Radius, using Odroids as Radius, and so far the Tinkerboards work better. Uh, even though they do run hot and require external cooling, uh, they work just fine. Uh, the DNS server, the Tinkerboard, is, is also used for that. Uh, I do not run the ASUS operating system uh, because they haven't updated it <laughs> in probably a year and a half now. So I do run a version of Debian on those. Um, LDAP server, RPI3. And, and of course, that, that <laughs> for my use is fine. Uh, the Gluster file servers are Odroid HC1s and HC2s for the ones that have storage. And then I, I have a tier which uses, uh, 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 uses the uh, Pine64 Pro boards. And that's because you can plug a PCI card into them. Uh, so I have NV, N, NVMe drives that are attached to those. They're, they're used as tiered storage. So if, if uh, there's uh, files that it detects that are more used, Use it'll copy it off the slower SSDs and onto the NVMe for retrieval, and that really does speed things up. Media server, uh, Odroid N2. It also 
No, there's no GUI on that one. So, the, like I said, the only desktop I use is the Jetson Nano, and it does it does fairly good. Um, it, it does fairly well. Uh, I have tried GNOME on it. GNOME is terribly slow on that machine, but it is the older version of GNOME, and we all know about that. XFCE seems to work pretty good. KDE works pretty good. Uh, Mate, I played around with that a little bit, but some of the ARM, some of the ARM software for uh, that was provided by NVIDIA didn't work. So I, I use, uh, sometimes I use XFCE, sometimes I use KDE with it, and that all seems to be okay for me so far. Um, <clears throat> I have not tried every ARM SBC out there, so <laughs> I can't tell you, but I have tested Raspberry Pis, Odroids, Pi64s, and Tinker boards, and of course the uh, uh, NVIDIA Jetson uh, Nano for on, on desktops. I just find that uh, the Pine 64 <clears throat> Pro do a fairly good job, but they, uh, I think there's some problems in, at least at the time I tested it. This was back <clears throat> when the uh, operating system was still in beta. I haven't tested it since because I have pushed those over to do Gluster, but um, there was problems in some of the video rendering where it would hang. And I think that was just simply a problem with the early kernel. Those were beta kernels in that, in that time frame. <laughs> But yeah, I haven't tested that since. But it the the sixty four Pro does a fairly good job with it, and I and um and it's not bad. It's not bad from what I I uh, had played with. But uh, any of the other Odroids or the Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi four, not bad either. Uh, <clears throat> I have tested a few things, but I, I I'm not really going to comment whether it's good or bad yet. I just I haven't gotten back to it. So, but the Tinkerboard, nah. Uh, for <laughs> no, <laughs> that, that is not a very good one. It is uh, so. Some final thoughts. Uh, I have run into the problems that Alan uh, Pope talks about with the PPAs and the available of ARM uh, availability of ARM packages, but I have seen that more common with the desktop than I have with the server. The server side of things, it's pretty easy to find ARM packages. It's uh, 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 the PPAs, there's a, uh, it, the ones that are supporting ARM, they have a true commitment to ARM. Uh, those have ARM uh, releases as well. The, the, the problems that you're going to run into is like he described, you're going to run into them on the desktop. However, um, I, I, you know, I, I haven't personally found it an issue, but I don't run a lot of PPAs on my servers. I have one. And that is for the Gluster FS, uh, but that particular uh, set of people <clears throat> that do the development for Gluster FS have a very strong commitment to ARM. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, when there's a new release of Gluster, there's a, a new release of x86 and uh, ARM as well at the same time. There's no wait, no delay. Uh, Mali-based ARM uh, GPUs are okay, but they're not great for video. <clears throat> I suspect the problem here is that Mali, I don't know for a fact, but I suspect that the problem with Mali is that they hold tight to their APIs, and so it isn't easy to uh, find out what is the best uh, type of uh, code to use to do that, or maybe the best uh, optimizations you can use to deploy that. They uh, I mean, if you've done development on Mali, you know it's notoriously difficult to program for that that particular platform. So, um, so the uh, uh, performance. The only applications that I have seen uh, that really suffer are virtual machines. Um, I have run Docker a little bit on uh, ARM, and you know, you know, Docker's <laughs> Docker can can be whatever your application needs are. It can be lightweight. It can be heavy. It just depends on what you need. Uh, but the big problem with uh, ARM uh, for the SBCs are the lack of cores, lack of memory, uh, because four gigabyte isn't really enough if you're doing virtual machines. You, I mean, <laughs> if you had six cores, you might be able to do two virtual machines, leaving two for the operating system. But uh, yeah. Um, that's a big problem. Uh, so I think, I mean, ARMs do not have uh, the, um, the, the thread, the soft threads that uh, Intel are hyper-threading, and uh, the hyper-threading that Intel has. So uh, you get what you get. So if you get six cores, you get six threads. Um, so that, I think, is a problem. Uh, so I don't, I can't, I, I can't run ARM on uh, VMs. It just, it doesn't work for me. Uh, so I do have to use x86 for that. For DNS radius, LDAP, and RLOG, which is in the audit server, 
Uh, I can't notice any performance differences between ARM and X and X86. There's, I mean, it's mostly network latency that's uh, that's really the factor. I, I mean, the machines are fine. However, for Ansible, I have noticed a difference. Uh, there is a, a distinct performance difference between X86 and ARM, and of course, X86 is faster. Pi, uh, Ans Ansible is written in Python, and <clears throat> Uh, and and uh, so, for me, I still run it on ARM because I don't want to give up my x86s to Ansible. I, I and I don't want to put Ansible on a virtual machine. So, uh, so uh, yeah, it, <clears throat> there's some kind of strange behavior once in a while on ARM with Ansible. Like uh, sometimes it'll hang while it's doing its initial. There's an initial phase where it goes out and d identifies the type of machine that it's talking to, and sometimes it hangs there, but. I think that's more software bugs than it is ARM bugs. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it works good enough for me for what I use it for. If I was trying to hold on to a deployment for a server, I would definitely move that to an x86 environment. <clears throat> so how do I use ARM? I use it for servers. I have one desktop that is ARM based. I follow the AT&T Bell Labs mantra uh, on, all my ARM uh, on all my ARM machines. One machine, one application. Uh, and that was true because of the speed of the machines back then, and I hold to that for ARM until they get up into, you know, if you're going to buy a $50 machine, <laughs> you can't expect a lot from them. So uh, I try to hold to that mantra. It also makes it a lot easier to manage. Uh, desktop performance on ARM, it's poor unless it's NVIDIA Jetson. Uh, at least that's been my experience. PPA issues, yeah, uh, yeah, most definitely there are issues with PPAs. I have hit them on occasion, so I try to avoid them on the server environments. Performance overall, Ansible is okay, but it's slower than x86. Uh, the other apps I run, I cannot notice any performance difference, except, of course, for virtual machines, and that's why they're on the x86. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this today. Um, let me get back over here so I can talk to you. Um, so I, I hope you enjoyed this today. Uh, I just wanted to add my two cents. I'm not trying to be contrarian at all to what he was saying. I, in fact, I agree with most of the things that he said. Um, but <clears throat> I'm looking at this from a little bit different view than from the desktop. I, whether or not I think ARM is ready for the desktop, can't tell you. Uh, the I would certainly use the NVIDIA Jetson Nano as a desktop, certainly. It is definitely fast enough. Um, whether I would give up my x86 machine, probably not. Um, <clears throat> there are enough differences in the way Linux runs that I would prefer to stay on the x86. So that's my closing thoughts for today. Hope you enjoyed this. Please like and subscribe. And as always, hope to see you again in the next video. Bye for now.